Cervical myelopathy is a pretty scary term. Let me tell you what it means, how to diagnose it, and how to treat it. First, let's break down what the word is. Cervical is the cervical part of the spine. We have cervical, thoracic, as well as lumbar spine. There are seven bones in the cervical spine. Myelopathy is a fancy medical word for um, death of spinal cord cells. This is usually over a slow period of time. When they're getting squeezed or compressed. Another type of this um, compression could be in a trauma such as car accidents, falling off of a roof, doing a dive into a lake and hitting your head. That would squeeze the spinal cord abruptly, leading to a spinal cord injury. Myelopathy is a similar process. If this is a model of the spine, and we're looking down a tunnel of the spine, there are different factors that could compress the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord starts from the brainstem and goes all the way down to the bottom of the thoracic or top of the lumbar spine. Compression could be from multiple things in the cervical spine. It could be from a disc herniation, or when you're looking down the tunnel, a disc pushes back, squeezes that spinal cord. It could be from bone spurs. This is the most common cause. These bone spurs aren't just sharp, jagged edges that form all of a sudden. They're from a repetitive wear and tear where the joints in the back part of the spine are rubbing. Similar to how you get a callus formation on your hand or on your feet, a uh, bone spur is almost like a callus formation. It's an extra thickening of tissue that then hardens and becomes bone. This is sometimes called the ligamentum flavum. That's a tissue in the spinal canal that's normally a protective or strengthening tissue. Over time, from wear and tear, it gets thick, it hardens, and it could start growing, something called hypertrophy. So if you look at an MRI report and they mention ligamentum flavum or hypertrophy, it is thickening of tissue, and the ligamentum flavum is a specific type of tissue. Another common cause of cervical myelopathy is from when one bone is slipping forward on the other. This could either be from trauma or from when the joints in the back of the spine wear out and you get spondylolisthesis, where the bone starts slipping forward. But when this bone starts slipping forward in the neck, it would start to slowly thicken these joints in the back. That starts growing extra tissue that pushes it from the back. And then when one bone slides forward, if the analogy is looking down a tube, if they started shifting, it would pull that spinal cord. Again, this is from chronic arthritis, wear and tear. When you're looking down, it starts sliding forward, it would be squeezing that spinal cord, dragging it forward. Well, a finding you might see or read on your MRI report is something called myelomalacia. That's when essentially the observer sees a white dot or white um, halo appearance in the spinal cord. That white represents essentially death of spinal cord cells. And that's seen on the T2 image of the MRI. That's death of spinal cord cells. That shows that these cells are dead. They're not coming back. And that's significant. That's serious. Based on other findings, that alone could warrant surgery. What are the presentations of cervical myelopathy? One of the early presentations is balance issues, coordination issues. We used to say fumbling with keys or decreased handwriting, but in modern society, we use car keys and even house keys a lot less. And we write a lot less, interestingly, because now we're typing many things and many of our cars have either automatic starts or wireless entry. So those aren't the common classic presentations that we usually can be asking patients about. I usually ask patients, if they have difficulty tying a tie doing buttons on their shirt, knitting, fine motor skills. Are they searching for things in their pockets and sometimes it just slips through their fingers? Those are the common questions I'm asking my patients. A quick test that I do in the office with all these patients, one is the Hoffman sign, and I have many videos on that. That's when you flick the finger and see if there's a pinching motion. You can't do it to yourself. Another is called clonus. That's when the legs are um, hanging down. You can jerk the ankle and if it starts undulating, multiple times that could indicate clonus, one of the findings of a spinal cord injury. The other is called the Romberg test. It's where you have the patient just stand up, arms by their side, and just close their eyes. If they have a swain, something like this, this is Romberg. Again, here's how you test for the Romberg sign. It's a classic finding 
for possibly having an injury or some type of insult to your spinal cord or in your brain. It's when you put your feet together, drop your hands by your side, and close your eyes. If your balance is off, if you start wobbling back and forth, that could indicate either an issue with your spinal cord or in the brain. I use that as one of my tests to help identify if a patient has cervical myelopathy, which is a death of spinal cord cells in the neck. And that could be from a disc herniation, arthritis, instability, a cervical myelopathy. An MRI as well as clinical exam would be the confirmation needed to identify cervical myelopathy. The next test I use is x-rays. They show me the bony structure, but most importantly is an MRI. Looking at the MRI to see if there is any spinal cord compression is a major way to diagnose cervical myelopathy. One would look down the canal as well as the side view, the sagittal view of this MRI. The next test I use is x-rays. They show me the bony structure, but most importantly is an MRI. Looking at the MRI to see if there is any spinal cord compression is a major way to diagnose cervical myelopathy. One would look down the canal as well as the side view, the sagittal view of this MRI to see how much spinal cord compression there is. This in itself does not mean you need surgery or even need to change your lifestyle. Really, this MRI would need to be correlated with the clinical exam, with actually putting your hands on the patient, talking to the patient, hearing about their history, doing those tests, doing the Romberg test. Those are key features to see how much this spinal compression is actually affecting their life and would warrant surgery or not warrant surgery. Again, this is a very slowly degenerative process usually. So if a patient is either not symptomatic or very mildly symptomatic, this might be something we watch every six months or 12 months, just with serial MRIs, as well as exams and updated history. In terms of the surgery, there's several different types of surgeries. One of them could be disc replacement. Another, kind of the more gold standard, would be something called an ACDF, anterior cervical discectomy infusion that stabilizes this area of the spine and prevents the motion at that already damaged spinal cord. The third could be something abbreviated as a PCDF, posterior cervical decompression infusion, kind of the workhorse of all spine surgery where it's an incision on the back of the neck, multiple level fusion. Another form that some might do is something called a laminoplasty. Those are four types of surgeries. Really, it's based on x-rays, exam, MRI, some surgeon preference. There's just many ways to take care of it. There's not one clear cut answer in terms of the best way to take care of it, just based on the term. It really is based on the exam, the patient, the surgeon, as well as the images. Cervical myelopathy is a big deal. Once cells die in the spine, they don't come back. There's multiple ways to take care of it. The first step is identifying if you think you have it, talking to your spine doctor. I would let a spine surgeon definitely be the quarterback here, not a chiropractic provider, not a pain doctor, not a primary care doctor who are extremely helpful. But if there's clinical suspicion, let a spine surgeon take a look.